things will not inherit the kingdom. Oh, they try to get into the practice and they say, well, that means if you do it once, you're not really practicing it. And, and that's all a fallacy as well. Doesn't say that. What did, it take, what did it take for anybody in the scriptures, like Eve, for example, in the garden? Did she have to continually disobey God? No, it was one time. One time. Because sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. That was the message from the beginning. The message of the Satan was, well, thou shalt surely not die. And that's what all this is. This original sin, this dual nature, this pagan stuff. They've changed everything. They've changed all your holidays, all your observances, all in, in accordance with ancient Rome. They've changed, uh, they've changed this, uh, the idea of, of, of ability and unhindered free will into original sin and moral depravity. You know, here's a short list of the doctrines that have invalidated the gospel you know, since the days of Augustine in 3rd, 4th century Rome. Every one of them traces back, like I said, every one of these. Look, look at these. First and foremost, you got the, 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 the top right out of the dragon's mouth, original sin. You call it inbred sin, uh, moral depravity, uh, limited ability, whatever you want to call it. it. It's all the same thing. Bing, 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 right back to Augustine. Election, predestination, immutability of God, meaning God never changes his mind. Bondage of the will, no free will. Saved in sin, faith alone, all of it. Again, boom, right, lands right at the door of this guy here. The biggest heretic that ever lived. Must have been put on earth by Satan. Ill illustratively, at least, because he succumbed to that because of his own lust of the flesh. Uh, moral transfer, you know, the transferred righteousness of Christ, the imputed, that, that you're imputed while you're still, imputed righteous while you're still in your sins. Uh, declared righteous while you're still unrighteous. All the things they call it today. All the silly illustrations they come up with. All of it, again, traces right back, right back to the original source. Sins forgiven in advance by the provision that was made on the cross. Past, present, and future. It's all eternity now. It's all done for you in advance. And you just receive that. They'll say, well, how many sins? Which sins? The sins, every sin. Past, present, future. That's how they look at it. See, they don't look at sins previously committed. They don't look at that. They think the free gift is covered a whole thing. No matter what you do the rest of your life. Again, all originated with this guy that wanted to cover his own sinfulness and come up with a doctrine that pleased him. And he did so. And the Reformation, they didn't reject it. They didn't cast it to the wind like they should have and throw it on the trash heap of history and start preaching repentance and faith proven by deeds. No, they redefined it in the tulip and the Westminster and the limited ability and all the other stuff. So limited, limited free will, uh, provenient grace, gradual sanctification, all the holiness stuff that you know maybe we could get them holy eventually. Sin, uh, saved in your sin and then God cleans you up later somewhere down the road all that kind of stuff but they never stop sinning and the preachers today they tell everybody they're the Romans wretch and, and, and all that other stuff so they're never they're never going to come out of their sins to begin with because they never they never did see they have to come out when they come to Christ and you got the wretched man the Romans 7 that was again Augustine he's the first one to define it that way before him, nobody defined it that way. He did. He did. Now, many men in the, in the Reformation rejected that, as I pointed out, some on the Wesleyan side. But bottom line, they still underscored it with this limited ability of man, hindered in some manner by this myth of original sin. They may not have wanted to call it that, but they called it other things. It was the same thing. So here, then, we have the whole gamut of excuses that come out of this. Like I said, you could read this Westminster, all the tenets, all 30-some of the tenets, and you'll find these excuses underscored in their tenets. Nobody's perfect. You can't judge. It's not of works. It's a wretched man, the chief of sinner, the filthy rags, the carnal Christian. It's all in there. Uh, if I say I have no sin, there's no truth in me. How about if I say I don't keep the commandments, there's no truth in me? John said that too. If I could stop sinning, I'd save myself. I wouldn't need Jesus. I could self-justify all that, all that, because man has no ability whatsoever. 
No one can stop sinning. And, and then, of course, they cast this, but what, do you sin? And they think that's the gotcha question. That, that of course, everybody's a liar. If they say they have no sin, they're liars to begin with. That's their thinking. They're not thinking of righteousness and holiness and purity and guarding their heart and all that stuff. They're thinking of sinning every day and thought, word, and deed and being covered by the magic cloak. So you got the free gift and you're dead to the law, as we covered in our previous lessons. They don't have to keep the righteous requirements of the law because they're dead to the law. They're removed from any responsibility or consequence. So nobody's righteous and everybody's a sinner saved by grace. There's no one righteous. Even though the Bible constantly points out righteousness amidst unrighteousness, comparing the two all the way through the pages of Scripture, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom. Only the righteous, only those that are doing what's right by a faith working by love. So here we have then the tyranny of suppression. There's oppression, of course, in the world. But it's just based on ethnic group things and labels, not on the reality of truth. This spans hundreds of years reigning over the churches, the so-called churches, making the word of God of no effect, and it's all linked to the common thread dating back to ancient Rome. It's now divided into thousands of denominations and creeds and orthodoxies and confessions defined, as I said, Babylon, mass confusion that people have to unravel, and we have to spend all our time digging people out from under that and trying to show them the truth. And that's what happens when they try to, when they try to come out of this. It's layer by layer by layer coming out of this deception. In essence, they all preach the same message, underscored with the same things, but they vary in their approach to it. Bottom line conclusion of all that they preach, as we've shown here with our little chart, is that man has been hindered in some manner, connected with his ancient past, to obey God and bring forth deeds worthy of repentance to be forgiven by God. Unless God then first intervenes in some manner, offset or uh, selection or election or whatever, he has to intervene in some manner so that he can do it for them or offset their inability that they have to break up their fallow ground and come and seek God and come clean with God, seek the mercy of Christ. So all the doctrines and the interpretations and the explanations and the excuses they all have their commonality in either limiting or eliminating, eliminating altogether man's God-given free will ability to obey and do what's right. And they give him an alternative to that obedience in all this doctrine that originated way back a long time ago. Really clouded and vague in people's minds where all this stuff come from. Because, I mean, they don't even want to study anything except their favorite pastime, let alone something that is going to affect their eternal out outcome. So well did Isaiah the prophet summarize what happened to the people back then, and it's repeated itself now in our present generation. In chapter 10, verses 12 through 13, he says, Sow for yourselves righteousness and reap in mercy. And break up the fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains right, righteousness on you. You know, through your broken heart of repentance and coming clean with him. You've plowed wickedness and you've reaped iniquity and you have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own ways and in the multitude of your mighty men. Who's your mighty men? Here they are. All the pundits. All the little parrots that quote each other. That pin each other's stuff that mimic what these guys said, mimic what that guy said, all dating back to what this guy said. When he came out of his Manichaeism, his pagan roots of, of ancient Rome, ancient Persia that spread into Rome, <clears throat> this dual nature, and then thereby corrupting the pure truth of the apostles and eliminating it from Rome in this massive tyranny of this dark age, very dark and bloody age. So the church then is going to, the present day church, under this delusion, the pastors and the pundits in charge, it's unlikely that very many of them are ever going to come out of this. Some might, but very few. 
So they're going to continue to eat the fruit of lies and trust in the multitude of their mighty men, past and present, and twist and torture the Bible and handle the word of God deceitfully and promise everybody liberty while they remain slaves to their own corruption. They can all get into heaven together by saying, Whoa, no. We can't do anything. Christ did it all for us. And that's what this whole thing is underscored with. Inability. Inability. Everything the pastor says Sunday morning, everything your Bible study, everything you do, every, every turn you make into the system and the TV channels and all that nonsense that's out there is underscored with this message that man's unable to obey God in some manner. And it all dates back to ancient Rome. The fallacies that found their way into the Reformation and now have come down upon our heads. In present day, the woman on the scarlet beast. Not just any one particular church. The entire so-called professing church is a system of error leading people in droves down the wide road of destruction. So you come out from among them and touch not what is unclean. And then the Lord will receive you and make you one of His own. Follow the truth in the true path through the narrow gate and strive to enter and make every effort that it takes before these people bring you under this strong delusion where you take pleasure in unrighteousness like so many do. Don't be one of them. Come out while there's time.